No single day on Earth would be complete without considering the daily changes that happen to life. And there's no better place to start than where geology fuels biology. Through the process of erosion, second by second every day, minerals and nutrients from the Earth are carried around the planet by rivers, she destroys, but also brings sediment, riches, food. By wind, dust is good for the environment, dust is good for Earth, and therefore dust is good for us. And by ice. The glaciers can feed the entire food chain. And when these essential nutrients and minerals reach the ocean, they kickstart one of the biggest daily changes to life on Earth. The growth of phytoplankton. This microscopic plant life is raised on sunlight, CO2, and rich minerals delivered from the Earth. A single teaspoon of water can hold millions of them. And satellites reveal that they thrive throughout the planet. They are the most fundamental food source in the world's oceans. But that's not all. Like all plants, these tiny organisms produce oxygen as much as the rest of the world's plant life combined. Which means phytoplankton provide every second breath you take. Twelve hours. In Twelve hours, I would do a really good hiking day. Nice weekend day hanging out with my family. In 12 hours, just half a day, fueled by a rich mineral soup, the phytoplankton have multiplied. If you could gather it together, this new plant life would weigh in at a gigantic five billion tons and form a mountain of biomass three kilometers wide. But before the day is out, most of this will be gone. In the world's oceans, this daily explosion of phytoplankton triggers one of the greatest mass movement of animals on Earth, far bigger than anything known on land. This happens every day throughout the world, but only the most determined ever get to see it. Sea creatures are rising from the deep. And these divers have come to face them off the coast of West Palm Beach, Florida. I'm going to free dive. It will be the first time that I free dive at night, and I think it's the best way to observe them. This might really be an incredible opportunity. Dr. Claire Perry Limousie is a marine biologist who's hitching a ride with a group of photographers. So you're ready? Yeah, it's getting good to dark. They're going on what's known as a black water dive. Linda Ianello and Noe Sarde are hoping to document one of the largest daily feeding frenzies on Earth. A lot of people think we're crazy. Float in the middle of nowhere, and it's 500 feet deep. You, you don't know, is there a shark out there that you can't see? So you have to be aware and you have to be careful. These black water dives are a great opportunity to capture video of these uh, creatures as they rise to the surface in their natural environment. Hi, Captain Sosa. Who's going first? If you're afraid of the dark and afraid of the depths, this is definitely not for you. The divers are floating above 150 meters of pitch black ocean, waiting for an invasion from the abyss.
Suddenly, they're in the thick of a wriggling, shimmering light storm. A galaxy of tiny, diaphanous sea life called zooplankton, swarming to harvest the phytoplankton that exploded in number during the day. It's like staring up at stars, like being in the center of the universe. You sense all this energy flowing around you. It's truly amazing. At first, you're looking around and you don't know where to start. There's all this plankton flying around, floating around in the water column, and they're all there to feed. It's challenging. It's not easy photography, but it's worth it. The teeming cloud of zooplankton is a microscopic menagerie. Everything from larval forms of larger animals like squid and crabs and rays to fully grown creatures like sea angels. This is my favorite shot. Very rare is the paper nautilus, also called an argonaut. You must so, have been excited. When I you was saw very that. excited. <laughs> we chased it to 84 feet, and this is a typical shot it wanted to give me, which is a butt shot. I think these animals are deep dwellers, so it means that they have migrate hundreds of meters. When we think of wild animals that migrate long distances on land, maybe once a year for breeding, whereas in the sea, every night there's this huge migration of the zooplankton across all the oceans. It's the largest migration on land. We know of no greater daily movement of animal biomass anywhere on the planet. And it has this interesting hole in between the eyes. That's amazing. That's probably sensitive to the light. So and it tells her when to go up right. and down. Our body clock may have evolved in plankton millions of years ago. The hormones that regulate their daily cycle are essentially the same that regulate ours. As the giant wave of zooplankton sweeps around the world, they leave a different ocean behind because of how much they eat. They might be small, but they have giant appetites. The zooplankton feed themselves at night and consume the equivalent of their own body weight, so they can double their mass every day. To compare that to humans, it would be as if I ate this amount of sandwiches every hour of the day. When you add up how many zooplankton are rising from the depths and what they eat, the numbers are literally, well, life-changing. For 13 hours, music festival. I'm with you. OK, he's with me, so that's a combined <laughs> one. <laughs> In just 13 hours, over five billion tons of zooplankton will have completed their daily migration. And consumed around 4.9 billion tons of phytoplankton. That's over 10 times the weight of all the people on Earth. On land, just like in the ocean, plants are the foundation of the food chain. So monitoring plant growth is like giving the planet a physical. Today, scientists are doing just that, checking up on the whole green fabric of our planet to give an hour-by-hour -hour progress report on how things are growing. I really love going into forests. Trees are, in some ways, the basis of life, and they're beautiful. <laughs> That one looks good. Yeah. In the Florida Everglades, Professor Lola Fatayimbo and David Lagomasino yeah, are tackling a, a seemingly impossible right. task, keeping track of all the trees in the world. 18 meters. I'll start the scan now. We scan one tree from one direction. Just like that. Then we'll move around a little bit to another spot. Scan two done. Scan another tree, and then we stitch all those images together. 
Scan three. And we get a nice 360 degree view of what the forest looks like. OK, look at how amazing the scan is. Real nice. Branching structure, yeah, leaves no. on it. By the time they're done with their lasers and 360 degree cameras, they've created a pinpoint accurate digital copy of the forest, allowing them to precisely measure every tree and shrub and calculate their growth. 20 grams per day. Every single day. There's a huge range and scales of how fast plants can grow. There's some bamboos that can grow up to 90 centimeters a day, where oak trees, on the other hand, will grow about a millimeter or so a day. What drives all this growth is probably the most important chemical reaction on Earth, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction that uses sunlight to produce sugar. That makes all the plants that we eat, air that we breathe, the basis for life on Earth. Daily photosynthesis produces, you know, hundreds of thousands of billions. <laughs> well, that's a tough one. <laughs> Fortunately, David and Lola aren't trying to work it out alone. They work for NASA and have access to a whole fleet of satellites. So here we're starting to see the global picture of photosynthesis. Satellites can show us what we can't see, like photosynthesis in action across the entire world. Earth observing satellites are really important because we can use them to look at changes in forest cover, and they give us an idea of what's happening globally every single day. A partnership between boots on the ground and eyes in the sky. That's how scientists like Lola and David are finally putting numbers on the colossal changes that happen on our green planet. Changes that keep us alive from the amount of oxygen plants release and CO2 they consume to the weight of new plant life that every hour brings. Over the last 14 hours, the time it takes to drive from Seattle to San Francisco, the world's forests have been growing strong. Adding 175 million tons of new growth to the planet. If you could put all that into one giant tree, it would stretch to three kilometers high. They've also produced 215 million tons of sugar and 230 million tons of oxygen. There's another way of thinking about growth. It's not just hundreds of millions of tons of new plant matter that appear around us every day. It's energy, harnessed from sunlight through the chemical process of photosynthesis and stored in every new leaf, twig, and branch. Energy which keeps us alive when we use plants as food or fuel. But energy which can also turn against us. Hey, Mom, I just texted you a picture. I'm standing right now, right in the middle of the house. They bought this house when it was built new in 1975. So they've lived here for 42 years. Um, the file cabinet's still standing there. Super nice neighborhood. It's where I was raised. That there is going to be very little, if anything, I'll, I'll dig around here, see if I can see what I can find, and uh... all right, love you guys. In California, they're facing the worst wildfires in living memory. 
Major Baird, this is Geo Rectified, right? Can you show him where the bird is on the map? This is a pop-up emergency response center just outside LA. Can we zoom into the spot on the ground that you're looking at? Once every three years or so, we get the winds before the rain, which is what happened this year. This particular fire has grown 14 miles in one day, which relative size is about twice the size of San Francisco County. It's down all the way into suburban areas, all the way down into cities and structures. The fire doesn't care what it burns. Power went out. My parents are awakened by the neighbor and the police saying, you've got to go right now. And they left my mom's car because they just couldn't get the door open easily and in a hurry. And you can see you know, what happened with that. A once in a lifetime fire for LA, but for the earth as a whole, this is business as usual. Right now, as you watch this, somewhere on earth, a wildfire is raging. Fire is a force of nature, and we've learned the hard way that trying to stop it only makes matters worse. The problem is, about 100 years ago, we adopted a philosophy where we were going to put every fire out immediately. That has led to a cumulative effect where the vegetative matter, the ecosystem, has begun to build up. And it's built up for so long in so many places. These areas are essentially tinderboxes, ready for a spark. And with 4 million lightning strikes every day, there are a lot of ways for the energy harnessed for years and years of sunlight. If you look at fire globally, it's like the reverse of photosynthesis. Releasing all that energy as light and heat. For a plant to grow, it needs sun and water. But sometimes for a forest yeah, to grow, so it also needs fire. All the charge. Yeah, you can really see Everywhere. where it went through. Yeah. Something that we don't always think about is how important fires are to many forest ecosystems. They clean up the understory and get more sunlight to their saplings. And it allows and thrives for wonderful species like the redwoods. The redwoods have grown so tall and massive because they had an open understory that was periodically cleaned out by a low-level fire. The bark just kind of flakes off. Fires are a layer. part of Earth's natural yeah, cycle of destruction and tree. renewal. A ferocious agent of change that life depends on. The problem for us is not the fires. It's that we have chosen to live where fires are most likely. We survived a fire in 1971. It burned right up to the back of the house, right up to my parents' backyard. People in California love the Mediterranean climate, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to live. The problem is that it's had a fire history that goes back millennia. We know that fire is going to happen. It will burn here. It's supposed to burn here. We're just trying to do our best to, to contain it. In 15 hours, you can just about get from London to where we are in the desert today. In 15 hours, wildfires have torn through 5,000 square kilometers of forest, turning to ash an area the size of the Grand Canyon National Park. hit the 16-hour mark, geology has grown vast jungles of aquatic vegetation, luring the greatest migration on Earth to the world's biggest salad bar.